my name is Peter Sharoshi and you are watching Drug Reporter Cafe, uh, our online video series on global drug policy developments. Today, we are going uh, to discuss the plan of the Amsterdam's mayor and city council to ban uh, foreign tourists from coffee shops in Amsterdam. Uh, the cafes that have been selling cannabis since the 1970s. Politicians claim that the cannabis coffee shops are generating so-called low-value tourism. That is, young people are going to Amsterdam uh, to smoke and party, but who have no absolutely no interest in, in other sites of the city. Uh, we tried to interview uh, the city council, uh, but they did not respond to our invitation. But we have here... Uh, uh, a guest with us who will discuss this issue with, with us, uh, who represents the Association of uh, Coffee Shop Owners, and uh, and he's a coffee shop owner himself, uh, and a researcher, and a well-known cannabis activist, Joachim Helms. Um, hello, Joachim, how are you? Thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, yes, uh to you too. <laughs> um, Thank you for the invitation, and um, I, I, I like to talk about this subject, so uh, thank you for that. So let's start uh, explaining how the, the, the coffee shop system works in, in the Netherlands, so how it was created and how it is regulated now, for those who yeah. don't know that. Okay, um, in a nutshell, it's a very um, um, bizarre system, if I explain it to you. Uh, we are used to it, of course, but uh, let me explain how it all started. So, um, 40 years ago, roughly, the, the government decided that uh, it, would be, uh, it would be better to separate the hard drugs, which we consider heroin and cocaine and everything, uh, with, from the soft drugs. So, we have a distinction between soft drugs and hard drugs. Uh, soft drugs being cannabis, uh, hashish and wheat uh, and edibles. Uh, so then the coffee shops were created, so to create a, a safe environment for the people to go inside, to get their information about all the different strains and the effects, um, and also a place to, to sit down and, and uh, have a coffee or uh, a drink and, and uh, be with friends and be, you know, safe and, and smoke a joint as well. Um, so so that, that was created... Uh, about 40 years ago, and it worked really well. Uh, we have also, um, you know, the, the, the result on, on public health, for example, is that uh, young people, um, and a lot of young people like to smoke cannabis, you know, at least to try also and, and figure out if it's uh, something that they like. Um, um, and, and if they want to buy it uh, in an illegal situation, they have to go to a dealer and they often also have other drugs, you know, so by making that distinction between soft drugs and hard drugs, uh, we, 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 we don't have many uh, hard drugs addicts in, in, in the Netherlands. We do have them, you know, just like any other country. But if you look in the, in the ranking, let's say, uh, we are very low on the, on the ranking. So uh, not a lot of people uh, use hard drugs in the Netherlands compared to other countries. So that worked really well from a public uh, health point of view. Uh, and then the bizarre thing about it is that they organized that pretty good, but then the backside of the coffee shop, so we are allowed to, to, to it's tolerated to sell up to five grams per person, uh, but then the backside of the coffee shop where the wheat comes in, that's never been organized good. So we always say the front door of the coffee shop has been organized really well, and the back door of the coffee shop uh, has not been organized. Mm. How did the current uh, COVID epidemic affect your, your businesses? Uh, yeah, it was uh, interesting in the uh, first week of, um, of, of, of the first lockdown. Uh, I think ev every country in Europe and uh, well, worldwide probably had a, had a first lockdown and probably everybody remembers where they were at the moment that they announced it. Uh, in the Netherlands, they announced on the Sunday... Uh, Sunday afternoon at 5.30, they announced that everything has to be closed at 6 o'clock. Bars, restaurants, shops, and also coffee shops. Um, and what happened then was uh, something that we have never seen before. There were huge lines in front of the coffee shop, you know, um, and people want, heard that they only had half an hour and to get, you know, their cannabis, and they didn't know how long it would take. Uh, so everybody was rushing to the coffee shop to 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 get the, their last few grams because yeah you never know how long it would take right uh, so that is when we discovered that cannabis actually is um, 
up there on the on the primary uh, um, products that the people like to uh, um, uh, use, you know. So um, it was obvious that alcohol and, and supermarkets, etc., were accounted as essential business. Uh, but they tried for 24 hours to close the coffee shops, but it was proven pretty quickly that cannabis and the coffee shops were also an essential business. So they kept us open uh, for takeaway. Uh, so we're not open for, um, for hospitality, uh, but we are open for takeaway. So um, some people, and uh, including the mayor of Amsterdam, say that uh, the coffee shops attract uh, foreign tourists uh, to the city who are not really interested in Amsterdam's cultural sites, but more like uh, partying and uh, making nuisance on the street. So, uh, so, so what do you think about those accusations? Uh, well, um, I think a lot of things about these accusations. Uh, anybody that is uh, smoking cannabis know that, you know, somebody who smokes cannabis is... Um, after smoking cannabis is not going on the street and making a lot of noise and, and, uh, and causing nuisance. So um, I think that picture of the, the smoker is a little bit exaggerated. Um, I also don't really agree with the, the, the accusation that the, uh, the tourists only come for a coffee shop to smoke uh, cannabis uh, because, you know, the, the, the young people can smoke cannabis anywhere, also in their home country, you know? So, of course, in, if you live in England, you will find a way to, to smoke cannabis. If you, smoke, if you live in Spain or if you live in Budapest, you know, if you want to smoke cannabis, you will find it. And, and cannabis is really not the only reason why the, the young people would come to Amsterdam. Um, Amsterdam is a really nice city. You know, we have, we have a very tolerant uh, uh, image. Um, uh, we are a liberal city with a lot of freedom and this appeals to a lot of people and um, after the first lockdown uh, we had in June, July, August was a little bit uh, lifted uh, the, the restrictions so what you saw then uh, was that a lot of young people came back to Amsterdam because they like to travel and Amsterdam is very appealing to them uh, so a lot of young people came back to Amsterdam and it is a fact if you look worldwide that, uh, you know, young people like to smoke cannabis. It's, it's, uh, cannabis is rising in, uh, in popularity. Uh, alcohol is a little bit uh, reducing. If you look at, uh, at America where, and Canada where it's really legal, you see that a lot of young people uh, uh, like to smoke cannabis. So it was, it was not, the, in my opinion, not the, co the, the reason that they would come to Amsterdam. I think a lot of young people like Amsterdam as a vibrant, tolerant uh, city. And that will always be like that, I think. Um, and, and, and they also go to the museum and they also go to the shops and they stay in a hotel. Of course, there will always be people that, you know, uh, come in the car and, and uh, you know, can't afford a hotel, but they like to see the city, so they sleep in the car. Um, this is something that the, the police can do something about, you know, and, and if it causes nuisance, of course, they have to act on that. Uh, but that's not the majority of the tourists that come to Amsterdam. It seems it's not only the coffee shops that are debated, but also like the, there are proposals to push the Red Lamp District out from the city center and create a so-called uh, uh, kind of sex zone outside of the city center. So do you think that the, there is the same uh, purpose here behind this, that, that they want to push the coffee shops outside of the city center and create somehow this uh, coffee shop zone outside of the city? Or, or what, is the, what is it behind this? Yeah, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a complicated uh, issue, I think. You know, it's not a, there's not a quick fix uh, solution to, to that issue, you know. Um, I was talking about the coffee shops are around for 40 years, but of course the red light district has been around for hundreds of years, you know. So it's such a historic thing. Um, and I think people will always want to come and, and have a look and, and the people that really would come and, and also make use of that, uh, um, uh, of the red lights that, that we have. Um, I think if you look at, at it from a broader perspective, I think for a city like Amsterdam, uh, who has an issue with tourism, like any other big city in, in, in the world, really, you know, if you look at London has that problem, 
Paris, Barcelona. Uh, I've been to Budapest. It was very busy in the center. Every inner, uh, the center, center of the big cities are very busy. So I think if you look at that problem, um, I think part of the solution is definitely to spread out the, 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 you know, the attractions where the people want to go over the city, you know, and that doesn't not only go for the red light, but that also goes for coffee shops and that also goes for museum and it also goes for cinemas, etc., hotels. It's very important, of course, to spread it out over the city so that not everybody comes to that small part of the city um, and with the result that it gets too busy there. Um, so what do we know about those bans that were introduced in other cities of the Netherlands? Because we know that in some of the border towns, they already introduced bans on uh, foreign, uh, foreign tourists to buy cannabis in coffee shops. Yes. Do you see the impact of, of those bans? Yes, we, we do see that. And you see also the results of that. Um, this, this started in 2012. Uh, uh, when the government um, um, made that extra rule the, to, to ban the tourists from, uh, from the coffee shops. So we have a couple of rules, you know, as, as a coffee shop, that's we can't advertise, no hard drugs, no young people in the shop and, and 500 gram maximum in stock. Uh, and they added the extra rule, no tourists uh, in the coffee shop. Um, and then they decided that the mayor of the city can decide to you know if they want to um, um, if they want to uh, uh, maintain that rule so if you know enforce that rule uh, so a lot of cities are not enforcing that rule because they foresee big problems if they do um, one big city in the south of the Netherlands which you might have heard of is Maastricht um, um, because the Netherlands is kind of like ends in a, like a small part uh, on the right bottom, um, and it, it's uh, next to Belgium, Luxembourg, and Germany. So there's a lot of countries around it. And of course, uh, if Maastricht is the place where you can, you know, legally buy your weed, there were a lot of people driving with the car to Maastricht, um, and 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 all the cars in the center were causing the disturbance. You know, so. Uh, Maastricht enforce, uh, enforces the rule still, uh, but there are a lot of other cities that, that turn back the rule, actually. They were enforcing uh, the rule. Um, for example, in Flissingen now, uh, they are stopping on the 1st of April uh, because they see too many street dealers in the street and there's a lot of disturbance uh, from them. Um, and then they see they see that the the, coffee sh the tourist ban is not working for them. Uh, it's causing too many problems, uh, and they're turning it back. So they are having a trial for one year on the f from the first of uh, April. Uh, but there's many other cities that uh, turned it around. They did enforce it, but they turned it around because there was too much too much disturbance on the street. So actually, the result of enforcing that rule is is already quite clear. Do you have the numbers on like how many coffee shops are in Amsterdam and how much tax uh, revenue they they generate for for the state? Um, well, the tax revenue is is uh, probably a complicated number. There's 167 uh, coffee shops um, in Amsterdam. There's about 500 and something in the Netherlands. Um, there's an average number of on on all coffee shops, uh, but but. What it makes it difficult is that you have in the Netherlands some, some big coffee shops. If there's only two or three coffee shops in a, in a city uh, with many people, then the coffee shops are much bigger. And in Amsterdam, we have 167 coffee shops. So that means in the center, um, we have coffee shops, but there's many, many coffee shops outside the center as well. And they are those little coffee shops that serve the, the local people. Uh, and that's exactly the coffee shops that you would like. You know, so what they talk about now is that we have to make, make the, the coffee shops smaller again uh, by closing coffee shops. But then, of course, if you close coffee shops, then the coffee shops that remain will become bigger. So um, our point of view is always if you want to make the coffee shops smaller uh, to serve the local people, then, of course, you should not close coffee shops, but actually you should open more coffee shops. The video you are watching now is produced by the Rights Reporter Foundation, a non-profit organization which is not supported by any governments or political parties. If you like this show, please support our work on our website, thedrugreporter.net. 
make a donation today and become our supporting member. It makes a difference. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm wondering whether behind this uh, kind of attacks and accusations against coffee shops now, is it, is it, is it uh, some hostility against cannabis itself? Or is it, is it just that Amsterdam residents are really fed up with the mass tourism and its, its uh, effects? So is it because of cannabis or is it because of the, the tourism? Uh, that's a very good question, and it's a question that I wonder myself every day uh, <laughs> the last uh, couple of months because the discussion started really with the tourism. You know, there's too many tourism um, in the city. That's what, the, what the, they say, and uh, we have to do something about that. And then the, they started to talk about the tourist ban. If, if, what if we enforce the tourist ban? Maybe it will result in less tourists coming to Amsterdam, you know, so maybe being part of the solution. Um, this is how the discussion started. But that's a complicated discussion because on one hand, you want to make this, the inner city, you know, uh, um, better. You know, you want to also make it good for the people that live here. Uh, but to do that, if you close the coffee shops for tourists, of course, you will create a whole other problem. That's the problem of street dealers, you know, and those 24 hours that I just talked about that we were closed in, in March last year uh, showed us that, that that creates a lot of problems because the street dealers went on the street um, and, and of course they saw their chance. They saw their chance. So they, they you know, they handed out the menus uh, to all the people. They could buy everything on the list and, and not just hash and weed, but also ecstasy and, and everything else. Um, so you could see straight away the, the results. So by closing the coffee shops for tourists in the center, you actually make the situation worse. Um, so now we have a, a second discussion and uh, that's not the tourist uh, situation anymore, but that's we want to regulate the supply for the coffee shops, but the coffee shops are too big. So now we have to make them smaller. And that's the reason why we have to do the tourist ban. So we are a little bit lost in the discussion and, and, we have the same question that you just asked. Uh, is this to solve the tourism problem? Because actually that was the original problem. Um, and, and, and we have solutions for that. So that is not really, that should not be the problem. We can actually be part of the solution. Uh, or is it the pro problem that, you know, we want to close coffee shops? And of course, in the, you know, I've been in this business for 25 years and I've been fighting for legalization always. And not just legalization from a business point of view, but also from an activist point of view that I think, you know, cannabis is, is something that is not really that bad. And it's actually really nice for some people. And it's a really great alternative for people that don't want to get too drunk in the weekend. Um, um, so, so, yeah, also for that uh, reason, I'm, I'm fighting for legalization. Yeah, you already mentioned that... Uh... Uh, there is a so-called backdoor policy so that the coffee shops are supplied through the backdoor illegally and uh, cannabis is cultivated illegally. Uh, do we know wh where the cannabis which you can buy in coffee shops in Amsterdam is grown? Is it grown in the Netherlands or is it uh, imported from other countries? Um, yeah, that is different for all the coffee shops and also that's part of the problem of not having it uh, organized in a transparent way you know so uh, we have always been lobbying to uh, give the coffee shop the chance uh, in a way of a license or, or, or a tolerating system uh, to produce the wheat for uh, its own supply because with that you you know you create a, a much safer uh, product also because you are making sure that it has no pesticides you make sure that you know exactly what's inside the thc the cbd uh, no heavy metals uh, all those things you know so uh, the cannabis consumer should have exactly the same rights as a as a beer drinker for example if you buy a beer bottle it says exactly what's inside that beer right i mean so many alcohol percentage and and these uh, these uh, different uh, uh, flavors etc so that should be the same for the, for the cannabis so uh, at the moment it's not transparent um, coffee shops do have a way to, to test that the product is clean. Uh, there's basic, uh, basic uh, things you can do, you know, you can look under the microscope, 
Um, there's easy ways to test the THC and the CBD. So all the, 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 the good coffee shops uh, do this already. So they make sure that it's clean. They look under the microscope and they check also how much THC and CBD is inside. Uh, but it would be much better, of course, if we can do that in a, in a well-organized way. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, uh, the Dutch government started an experiment with uh, growing cannabis legally in some cities as pilot projects. How yeah. is that experiment going? Uh, well, the experiment is not uh, started in the way uh, of production yet. Uh, they are still in the phase of, uh, of um, selecting the growers. Well, the growers have been selected and now they are going to, through the procedure of getting all the checks uh, uh, that they are okay to start. Um, and then after that, they will start building the facility. Um, and then they start growing, of course. And um, the government is in a rush. They want to start uh, quickly. We noticed that. Um, luckily, as you know, I'm, I'm the spokesman for the, for the industry, for the, for, the, for the coffee shop association. Um, and... Yeah, it was it was a, a big step for the government also to speak with us because um, you can imagine if the justice department speaks with us, uh, the people that buy the weed illegal at the back door, it puts them in kind of a situation uh, officially, uh, of course, because we are doing something illegal. Uh, so the first meeting was a little bit um, awkward in a way to you know to 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 meet with them and to to talk about our experience, but. We have a lot of experience from Canada and from America, what we see in all the legal facilities. So they saw that we bring a lot of information to the table and that we can really uh, help them to build an experiment that would be successful. Uh, so they were very uh, content with that. And they invited us many other times to, to speak with them, uh, to come up with a system that works really well for the coffee shops, for the government, uh, but in the end, of course, also for the consumer, because the consumer is in the end, you know, uh, the guy or the woman who, who buys the product and, and wants to smoke it. So in the end, it's the consumer that will make the experiment a success or not. You know, within, within civil society, there are some discussions and debates on uh, how Europe should regulate cannabis. Uh, and some people uh, are lobbying for an American kind of, you know, commercialized model. And we also see some Canadian companies coming to Europe to, to lobby for the very similar like, regulation. Others are pointing out that Europe has its own way to, to deal with this, like the Spanish uh, cannabis social clubs and uh, things like like that um, what do you see what is what is your view how how we should proceed with regulating the cannabis market should we follow the us or canada or should we uh, uh, create a, a european star uh, system um well i think of course i have the most experience with the, the coffee shops you know and and what i like about the coffee shops is uh, compared to for example uh, uh, cannabis social clubs in Spain where you really have to be a member uh, it's not really accessible for tourists um, uh, and and the system is good you know it's better than uh, having weed illegal uh, but what I like the social aspect of the coffee shop so I like uh, that people from different cultures can come together you know if you would come to Amsterdam uh, and you would join us at our table for example and we would have a coffee and maybe enjoy some cannabis uh, in this way, you meet so many different people, you know, and, and not just uh, the same people, but also different people, different religions and different cultures. And I, I really like that aspect of the coffee shop. So in that way, we still have kind of a unique situation in the world. Um, but of course, we have that limitation on the back door. So if I would say, what is my ideal situation, then it would be to combine the Dutch situation where we have the coffee shop with the social element and then the, a system like in America or, or, or not in Canada, really, in some states it's different, of course. Uh, but in America, you can just grow the weed and you have that whole vertically integrated system. So you have from, from seed to, you know, the sale of the product, everything's transparent with track and trace. You can see where it's coming from. Uh, and I think that's the system that works really well. Uh, in Canada, uh, in, in yeah, the, the biggest state maybe where, you know, in, in Ontario, for example, the, the licensed producer first have to sell to the, to the 
to, to the government, eh, to the OCS, and then they will sell it to the dispensary or to the final uh, consumer. But in my opinion, the government should not interfere so much with it. In the end, they have to accept it as any other uh, product, and and uh, it has to produce. It has to be produced in a safe way, and the people have to, you know, get the information that they need to use it in a safe way. But I think it's not something that the government should be involved with. What do you think? Why the the Americans did not adopt the coffee shop system? Because there you can just go and buy it in the store, but you can't smoke it there. So yeah. what's the reason behind that? I think the reason is that it's just a matter of time. I think, of course, um, if you compare it with 10 years ago, when the war on drugs was still full on and, uh, you know, they were, um, uh, they were chasing after, you know, uh, the growers and everything and people were locked up in prison. Um, I think they came from very far. Um, so in a way, they already moved on w- way further than what we have here. Um, so if you look at it from that perspective, I think they have come really far. And what you see now in, in, in cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco, you already have lounges where you can smoke also, co- consumption lounges. Uh, so I think it's just a matter of time. Um, and, and for example, in Los Angeles, you have already um, some places where you, you can also smoke. So there's a restaurant uh, and in the restaurant you have uh, just like in a wine restaurant where you have the sommelier talking about, you know, the different wines that go nice with the, 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 the food. In that restaurant, you have a, a weed sommelier, you know, that gives the advice about, you know, what weed or, or concentrate or uh, extract go nice with some of the dishes that they have on the menu. And then you can have your vaporizer there or you can roll a joint. Uh, and and, and that in, in a way, that's also unique. That's something that we don't have. So I think it's, it's growing and it's going very rapidly. Uh, also in Las Vegas, uh, every time we travel there, uh, it, it moved on already uh, way ahead of what we have in, in Europe. So um, I, I think it will get there. And also in Canada, every year there are um, uh, new things going on. So also there it will happen. Okay, so we, before we finish this conversation, can you tell those young people who are watching us from other countries and maybe they want to go to Amsterdam to have fun after this uh, lockdown is over and uh, they may have plans to go to coffee shops. So what can they expect uh, if they go after the lockdown? Will they find still uh, purchasable cannabis in coffee shops or you think that this ban will be introduced? No, uh, they are uh, definitely welcome um, and they are also welcome in the coffee shop. Uh, It's a debate that is uh, going on. Uh, It's a complicated discussion. Um, of course, we want to be part of the solution and uh, we don't want to be part of the problem. Uh, but the good thing is that um, maybe it's also because of the lockdown. I'm not sure, but uh, everybody's talking with each other and having uh, discussions. So um, there's, there's a lot of things going on. But uh, the mayor and the, and the city of Amsterdam are not moving that fast. So it will take at least until uh, 2022 probably the end of the year until if something would change. Uh, but watch the social media, uh, everybody in Hungary, because there's a lot of uh, things on the social media, uh, truths and uh, sometimes not truths. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, yeah, people will see it if you are not welcome in the coffee shop anymore, because it, it, it's really something that gets a lot of coverage. Yeah. Joachim, thank you so much for being with us and accepting our invitation. Yes. Good luck with your work. Yes. And and thank you for those who are watching us on on Facebook. Please uh, share with this video with your friends. And uh, we are a non-profit organization depending on private donations. So if you like Drug Reporter Cafe, please give us a donation. It makes a difference. Thank you very much and goodbye.